The Spin-Off Podcast Network. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The Spin-Off's new documentary, k p o l i s follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like, celebrate yourself. Watch k p o l i s today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. Jane, Alex, and Duncan from the Real Pod here. Say hello. 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 If you've ever listened to our podcast, and you should, by the way, then you'll know we are very big fans of Nando's. Huge fans. And we're also all spending a lot of time at home at the moment. A lot of time. But we've got some good news for you. You can get Nando's delivered right to your door, so you don't even have to brave the outside world. No judgment. The world is actually on fire. Nando's is available through a bunch of delivery services, but hot tip: if you make your delivery order directly from the Nando's website or the app, you'll earn Perry Perks points, which you can. Then use towards future orders. So get out your telephone, download the Nando's app, or open your laptop and visit nando's.co.nz. You won't regret it. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab. Offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. Kia ora koutou katoa, and welcome to Business is Boring, where today we are talking tech companies and seeing it to be it. Tech companies are pretty unique in business. They're places lots of people can grow and be themselves. There are flatter hierarchies and lots of perks. But although tech is a place where once you get there, it's unusually possible to grow and move up without the kind of formal qualifications and structures you find in traditional corporates, there's still the issue of getting enough people to know that they're able to be in such companies in the first place. This was the case for today's guest, who excelled in his studies and found himself in a big bank, but not loving life in a suit and saying he was a banker. When he discovered the tech world, he couldn't believe he hadn't known it was open to him. And if it was hard for him with his background, he wondered how hard it must be for others without his advantages. So he set up Matchstick, a way to create more visibility, pathways, and connections into the tech industry. To talk his journey, How people can get access to this world and opening up those pathways. Greg Denton, founder of Matchstick, joins us now. Tenakwe, thank you for being here. Kia ora, Simon. Great to be here. Hey, so take us back to the big beginning there. What was your start in business? Like quite a traditional path, yeah? Yeah. So I once upon a time studied law and finance.、Um, zero intention of ever be- becoming a lawyer,、um, but ended up in banking. So on the ANZ graduate program. Uh, working in the currency desk there during the financial crisis, which was actually really interesting.、Um, super fun time to be in part of、uh, that environment.、Um, and yeah, so did that for a few years. Eventually got sick of telling people at barbecues that I was a banker in and amongst the financial crisis. So packed the bags and yeah, headed off overseas to try and do something different and experience some different things. And that would have been doing the、uh, the conjoint degree and then. Moving into a graduate program and going into one of the the big banks—that's that's a very kind of standard approach to finding your way into the job market. Hey, exactly right. Yeah, I mean, it couldn't be more、um, standard, and I think it's you know something that really rings true for most university students is. 
the big corporates come and do their thing at university and suck up most of the talent. And, you know, at that point in time, I didn't really have too much visibility into uh, what those alternatives could be. So it was a well-paying job and a uh, recognisable organisation. And yeah, uh, that was kind of what I saw at that point in time. And then having been in what is kind of the, the kind of safest run, you decided to pack it all in and go and live somewhere else for a year? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, no disrespect to the banking environment. Met a lot of great people and really enjoyed my job. But I had recently had my brother sort of passed away um, relatively out of the blue, which, you know, certainly shakes you to your core and just made me start questioning what I was actually doing uh, with my life. So ended up traveling through South and Central America for a year, which was uh, epic fun, a lot of surfing and just a lot of exploring. And eventually wound my way up to Vancouver, Canada. Um, half of the reason there was I loved the mountains. The other half was most of my friends were in London. The likelihood of me going back into banking and hanging out with the same people was quite high. So I thought I'd try something different. And then what led you into the world of high growth companies uh, in, a, in a very different kind of role than uh, being a currency trader? Yeah. So originally I was actually uh, had the aim of starting a microbrewery, uh, which was super fun, learned how to brew beer, uh, but just got to the end of my one-year visa, as it was right then, and really needed a job to keep my visa. Looked at what Vancouver had to offer, which was commercial real estate and a little bit of tech, and decided that tech was obviously a lot more interesting. Um, managed to you know, convince them that my skills in the bank um, transferred over to a sales role at what was a hyper-growth startup, and yeah, just you know, head almost popped off the shoulders walking into an environment where, you know, a few years earlier I'm walking in with a suit and in a very formal environment to all of a sudden it's shorts and T-shirts and there's 50 dogs in the office and the average age is probably 23, 24 and, yeah, just this incredible environment that I did not know existed. Tell me about that company where you worked. Uh, as I think if you are kind of an online citizen and you know about social media and social media marketing and communication, you would have heard of Hootsuite, who, yeah, really invented a category and helped to create the idea of being a social media expert with certification and all of these things that, yeah, really defined the area. Yeah, um, so it was a super interesting company. I think at the time it was considered the darling tech company of Canada um, before the Shopify's and many others have now probably surpassed it. And so every conversation or coffee I had with someone I was networking with, it almost seemed like all roads pointed back to Hootsuite. Um, so yeah, I managed to network my way into meeting some people there. They had this incredible uh, way of hiring back then. So because there was such interest in the company, they would run these hiring days where they would have you know TV cameras, uh, they would have a thousand people lined up around the block and they would let people into the building in groups of 50. And there would be sort of 50 staff in there that, you know, you'd have a two or three minute conversation with them. And if they thought you were a good cultural fit, you'd go through one door. And if you weren't, you went maybe through the other door. And so on one side of the door was HR telling you, you know, these are the opportunities. But the door you really wanted to go through took you through to the management where you had another five minute conversation. And if they thought, you know, technically you could perhaps fill the role you went upstairs into almost like an army tent and you met some of the executives. So it was like this fast forward recruitment process where in half an hour you've probably met five people right through to senior executive level and have a fairly good idea whether or not you were going to get a job. So that was my experience. I thought it was quite an incredible way of um, hiring at speed and at scale and the culture that they built, um, I suppose, really exemplified that it was a really good way of hiring at that point in time. It sounds like Squid Game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't imagine, I imagine there are flaws with it, but at the time these guys were moving so quickly that they needed to hire a lot of people and it was a great way of vetting people um, pretty quickly. And that world, the kind of world of high growth and, um, you know, tech companies is such an interesting one compared to the codified, strict corporate world uh, where everyone's pretending to be something they're not versus this kind of place where bring your whole self to work. You talked about the dogs, uh, the fact that everyone's not not in suits. Tell me about what that culture was like for you and how that opened you up to the world of how there were all these other kind of ways to work and be in business. 
Yeah, I mean, it couldn't have been more different, really. I think the first office that we moved into used to be used by, I think, the equivalent of their police armed defender squad for doing like tactical training. So it was almost like a bit of a bomb shelter that they were starting to convert. And my first week was given a laptop, a Mac that I'd never used before, told that I was selling into these three or four states down in the southeast of the states and just to go to work and not too much more instructions than that. So it was terrifying to start because there was really no support, but I think that also encouraged you to just go and figure stuff out and lean on the people around you to work out what we're doing. I had no idea what our technology was. So, you know, starting from scratch to figure out, A, what do we actually do uh, as a business? And then how do we go and sell something that was really new at the time um, to customers that were just getting a handle on social media, let alone tools to manage it? So it was this radical responsibility to just go and, you know, um, take ownership and learn. And because everyone else around you was so competitive and trying really hard, it just you know, bought that competitive aspect out of you as well. Um, yeah, so that was a, a really great experience and I think something that super has certainly shaped my perspective of what I'd love to see more young people going into in the future. Yeah, one of the things, I had a really similar experience at Vend, the, the software retail company in New Zealand, and one of the coolest things about that, uh, it had all of the startup office cliches you could hope for, the standing desks and kegs of beer and all the rest of it, but the thing that actually was what was kind of compelling to everyone was the fact that you could come in as a support agent and then if you showed aptitude and wanted to learn and uh, were interested, um, you could become a product uh, manager. And product managers, you you know, are are basically like little CEOs running their own little business within the business. And then they'd be able to learn and be supported to, to grow. And what school you'd gone to or what your qualification was or who you knew didn't actually matter. What mattered was if you had a good attitude, learnt and, and gave things a try. And I'd never been in an environment that was that um, kind of free. Yeah, that's and exactly the same experience. Um, I think such a flat organisational structure where, you know, sometimes in the morning your CEO would challenge you to a game of ping pong um, in terms of just, you know, that open. But I think the really cool thing about it was, as you said, you'd have all these young people that would come in with zero experience and start in, you know, some pretty punishing jobs of business development, like cold calling people and starting, you know, to develop leads that would then filter out into every part of the organization and end up being the most excellent at all of those crafts because they just, you know, demonstrated the hunger and they had the environment to go and learn and, and grow in different directions. And so you, you know, thrived at this company and, and, and grew grew really well with it. What brought you back to New Zealand and what was your experience when you came back here? Yeah, so I'd moved with them to London, um, had a great time but started to think, you know, really missing the ocean, missing my family, uh, time to come home and have a look around. And as I started to think about that move and started to think, what do I want to do next? It was 100% I want to go back into that early stage startup journey and um, start to do that with a Kiwi company that I really care about. And I'd been away for seven years now, so most of my network was still bankers and lawyers and people that were working in professional jobs and just found it an absolute nightmare to figure out what these interesting companies were. We hear of the zeros and we hear of the vens, but below that, it's really difficult to actually understand what those uh, companies were. So I started um, in some ways to try and solve my own problem to figure out how do I actually start to develop a network in the space um, and still found that quite a a challenging process and hence why that was the early genesis of what we started with Matchstick. What was the process that you took to try and understand what the landscape was like and what these companies were and why might that not be good for everyone? Yeah, so I think the same as Vancouver, um, I, you know, decided if I went and had 20 coffees with someone uh, with lots of different people, by the end of that I would have narrowed down, hopefully, like some interesting paths to at least uh, what leads to Chase. So I went through that same process and went and met as many people that would humour me for coffee, um, met some incredible people, um, but through that process just realised, A, this is super laborious, and B, you know, me, someone that can do that, um, that has, you know, every advantage under the sun, why does it have to be that hard? Like imagine it for someone that didn't have those networking skills or the ability to ask um, someone for a coffee to try and figure this out. So 
started thinking, is there an easier way just to make access to the insight that people really want, which is what is it really like to work in this company and what do people actually do available to anyone? And I guess that if you had come up through, uh, you know, good uni, you did all, all the right kind of things and you hadn't known that this world was available to you, um, yeah, how would you know <laughs> the world is there and there's a place where um, there's heaps of opportunity and it's not too constrained and, you know, maybe the, the qualifications you walked in with aren't as important as the attitude that you bring. Yeah, I mean, you really wouldn't. It, it really just depends on who you know a lot of the time, I think, or uh, I suppose your ability to go out and meet people and network. And for introverted people like myself, I think the idea of networking or cold reaching out to someone on LinkedIn outside of their immediate circle is terrifying. Um, so I've always just thought that seemed a bit ridiculous that uh, it really, the jobs market does favour the people that can go out and get that insight or they have the networks to get that insight. And that often really disadvantages people that uh, I suppose don't have those skills or don't have that uh, ability to go and do that themselves. And we'll be back in a minute to hear from Greg how this insight led to the launch of Matchstick and how people can get involved. Spark is proud to partner with the Sustainable Business Network and the Climate Action Toolbox. The free Climate Action Toolbox can provide you with simple step-by-step guides to measure and reduce your emissions. Help lead the way to a low-carbon future for New Zealand. Visit sparklab.co.nz forward slash sustainability to find out more. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. If you can't be it, you can't see it, is a truth that talks to how a lot of people miss out on opportunities that they could have if they could see a pathway. Tell us about how Matchstick kind of came about to help more people be able to see it and then be it. Yeah, I suppose the first insight was around the coffee date. So how do you digitise that coffee date to make it, you know, the insight that you would get from sitting across from someone available to anyone? So... The first part of it in some ways has been me having a lot of almost coffee conversations with a whole range of interesting people um, and making those available to anyone that wants to learn about the career journeys of you know what people did before they got into tech, how they originally got into tech, what they actually do day to day and what they love about it and trying to do that across a really wide variety of people so that anyone can identify with these people and see that there is no straight line path into a lot of these companies. You know, I've interviewed people that used to bake bread that are now, you know, software engineers. Uh, there's all sorts of different career paths that have come into this. So, yeah, that was the original part was how do we actually just provide more visibility for a start into the people behind uh, the curtain? And then the next part of that is then how do we start to create more of a two-way engagement with those people so you can get a deeper level of insight? And how did you go about doing that? A lot of knocking on doors or pestering people in their LinkedIn inboxes. I think um, the great thing is is that a lot of people are really interested in sharing their insight. And I think many people don't actually get the opportunity to share their career stories. We often talk to founders or we talk to business leaders, but there's a whole range of interesting people that make up a company that have really interesting things to say, but they never get tapped on the shoulder to ask. So most people, I'd say, when we do reach out, have been super interested in sharing that journey. And some of their insight is, I think, in many ways, more valuable to people that are trying to figure out their career because it's a lot closer to where they currently are today. 
it can be a lot more relatable. Yeah, way more applicable than just the startup founder who lived on ramen for three years. And, yeah. you know, like, you're like, well, I, I kind of need to, like, pay my bills and yeah. I've got a family to support and, you know, <laughs> I want to live a normal life. Exactly right. Yeah. So that was kind of the 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 way that we went about it. And that is starting to uh, build more quickly. We now just need to get to a place that, you know, it's not just me uh, having these conversations with people, that we can build a platform to make that insight um more available at a much larger scale. Yeah, Who are the people that you want to be seeing it at that scale? I mean, it's probably a little bit broad to say everyone, but in terms of the people that we want to be able to access this information, we want it to be available to anyone. So whether or not that's someone that's, you know, like me working in banking or at a KPMG of the world that's decided, hey, this was great for now, but I want to do something more interesting. What is that more interesting? And can I find insights from people that have made that transition or is it me or anyone coming out of high school or university thinking I don't really know what I want to do here Um, and the only advice that I'm getting is from my sister or my uncle or some careers advisor that might not have had a really broad career how can I tap into the interesting stories of people that I can put myself in their shoes to say hey these three people are really interesting seem to love what they do these 10 not so much but now at least I've got more of a broad perspective that I can start to um, narrow in on. Once you're in kind of tech companies or in that world, you can see that there aren't many barriers to being able to kind of like learn and grow. But what are the barriers for people even feeling like the world applies to them or that they'd be good enough to walk in the door and be able to kind of learn? Like what if your kids, what if you're a student at school who has thought that you know, maths isn't for them or it's only for people who have been to the right schools or the right universities or whose parents were in in tech? Yeah, I think by seeing the hundreds and hundreds of examples of people that have come from different backgrounds, I mean, one person that really springs to mind is Aaron Ward, the um, CEO and founder at Ask Nicely. You know, listening to his story of being a difficult teenager or someone that really didn't jibe with university and really, like, struggled with authority – to then blossoming into becoming quite an incredible entrepreneur. Um, I think those kind of things are so relatable to so many young people that maybe don't identify with traditional paths that it can just give them confidence that there is, you know, so many other examples that they can follow along with. So I think it's just about people being really authentic about their own struggles and how they went through not identifying with traditional paths so that others can, you know, pick up um, that same trail and start to follow along along with it. Yeah, and how about groups that are underrepresented in tech at the moment? Um, yeah, tell me about the mentoring that, that's been a real part of what the platform kind of started with, but also that you've been involved with personally to try and make some of these things. Yeah, I mean, there's no secret that New Zealand tech has got a major diversity problem, and I think that that's probably true of you know not just tech in New Zealand, it's probably tech globally, and it's probably a bunch of different industries as well. So the idea is, you know, how do we start to um, share more voices from more different backgrounds as to how people got started? I think uh, on the mentoring side of things, uh, outside of Matchstick, I have been involved with a really incredible organisation in South Auckland uh, called Pillars. Um, So what they do is they uh, essentially pair people up with kids that have had parents either in jail or are incarcerated uh, to give them you know, stability and visibility into um, people doing things outside of their immediate family or their, their immediate network. And that's been you know, a real eye-opener for me in terms of the, the young uh, person that I'm currently interacting with. Is This kid is really smart, loves maths, um, is you know, engaged in video gaming, loves digital art. He's got all, all of these incredible attributes, but when I talk to him about what he wants to do next, He's still try, trying to figure out whether or not that's go to university or what might uh, might be next. And I think there's a real opportunity for him to see people that he can relate to that might have gone into visual effects. They might have gone into building video games. They might have gone and studied computer engineering just to spark that excitement um, to give him the confidence to go and follow that path as well. Because I, I, I look at it and it's kind of, 
you can see that people are only maybe two or three steps away from being able to do it. Like, you know, maybe it's a, a course in coding, maybe it's a um, you know, your course in visual effects. But to think that A, um, you're welcome, and B, that there'll be a place for you at the end of this expensive thing just isn't that easy if you haven't always been in an environment where you're made welcome and things, um, <laughs> you know, the resources and um, and support are there. And and so, yeah, like tell us about the things that you're doing um, with Matchstick to help kind of build it out to be a platform that can that can do that. Yeah, so I think the there's two things we're trying to do. First and foremost is provide that visibility. So at least give them the visibility into seeing and hearing from people that they can relate to. And that's a lot of the work that we've done to date. The next part, and which is probably the most important part, is once they've identified those people and potentially those pathways, how do we then give them the plan uh, or the you know, two-way interaction with those people so that they can build the confidence to start following that path? So not so much just sparking their interest, but then how do we lead them down the path that's going to help them build those skills and get that confidence to go uh, into pathways that they might not have otherwise considered? And that's not just for young people coming out of university. Again, as I said, that might be people that are really unhappy in the career path that they've chosen, but need a bit of a roadmap and, I suppose, support of a community to help them veer in a different direction. And part of that visibility, something lots of people listening might have kind of heard or come across, is the um, the top 50, and now this year what's going to be um, uh, the top 100, uh, the list that you make about what these companies in the startup ecosystem uh, and tech ecosystem are like. Tell me what you're trying to do there and how that kind of puts a window in. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, New Zealand tech still has a major visibility problem. Um, And I can tell you that from working sort of two years trying to figure out what these best companies are. They still, um, outside of a pretty closed bubble, are not penetrating into a wider sphere of people, in my opinion, and from the conversations that I have. So we're trying to create a place that makes it really easy to identify what we would consider the top 100 and most innovative high-tech companies in New Zealand um, and do so in a way that enables people not only to see those companies but then to understand you know, what do they care about, who are the people that work there and start to humanise those people so that you can A, find the best companies in New Zealand but B, also find people you can relate to to see whether or not you know, culturally you're a fit and technically um, whether or not you could start to try and develop a career with one of them. And how can, if people are listening and want to help, um, yeah, like people listening might not necessarily think, like lots of people are kind of too modest to think that just talking about what they do can actually help when they're just busy doing things. But yeah, how could people get involved and who should be getting involved to kind of tell their story and help um, add to the richness of the understanding of these companies and, and, and help create more pathways? Yeah, I mean, right now we're focused solely on high growth uh, New Zealand tech businesses. So almost anyone that works in those companies that wants to share their career journey, regardless of whether or not they think it's interesting, um, we do. And a whole bunch of other people really do. So if there are people in those companies that work in, you know, weird and wonderful jobs that others might not really know what they are, we'd love to hear from them because those stories, when we hear um, people interact with them, it, it really does give people confidence that they can say, oh, I can also do that. And I think sometimes it's the ones that people are super honest and authentic. Like it's not the really short, glossy version of what they did in their career, but actually detailing the struggles. We did one recently with a guy, uh, Marcus Crane. His honesty and authenticity around his struggle just to get started in tech, going through a really punishing uh, you know, challenge of actually getting started as a software engineer, um, I think is something that can really help so many other people get inspired because it doesn't necessarily have to be this really easy process. It's something that you do have to work to figure out yourself. And I think seeing other people go through that struggle almost has, in a lot of ways, more benefit than the really you know, glossy leader stories that we often hear. Yeah, and we don't just need, although we do need lots of coders and engineers, but the tech companies don't just need those. There's so many roles for people in design and UI and UX and customer support. And, you know, there's so many different ways to be part of these companies. Um, marketing events um, that, that don't require code too. 
exactly right. I mean, half of a tech business is made up of the business uh, side of things. And a lot of the time, you know, as you said, you know, people coming into customer support, I don't imagine anyone, you know, comes out of high school and dreams of working in customer support. However, it can be a really interesting um, starting point into a career in tech and can lead to so many different um, pathways. Or there's lots of other, you know, component parts of a, a business that other people perhaps don't even know exist that they could, their skill sets would really um, nicely align to those uh, roles within a company. And at the moment, you've got um, a platform with really great relationships with a lot of these um, big companies and you've done kind of job fairs and things where people can come and do those traditional things. You've got the top 100 that lets people know kind of what it's really like and what the culture is in these organisations. And that's voted for uh, or put together by kind of insiders. Um, what are the what are the next steps for where you'd like to take Matchstick? Yeah, so right now I think we're um, too much of a one-way conversation, so a media company sharing content. Um, we need to start to transition that into more of a two-way conversation so that it's not so much about us sharing stories but others interacting with one another. And we want to do that in a way that's not just another Slack group or not just another forum where people get lost in the you know, expanse of it. How do we create a really fun and engaging way for younger generations that are growing up with these incredible video game environments or vi- environments that they feel more comfortable in so that they can start to interact with people and learn from others in a way that's you know, not what we're used to as someone that's sort of now in their mid-30s and probably used to something that's a little bit more Reddit or uh, Slack-like forums. And what will be success for you personally and for Matchstick? Success for Matchstick, I think, is just cutting down the time that it takes so many people to figure out their career path. So right now, depending on what source you listen to, but most people are making 10 career pivots over their career, and that might just be in a decade. I'd love to get to a place where the norm was, you know, you're making those pivots in five years or you're making five pivots in five years just because you had better information to make better decisions more quickly and people that are turning up to work really loving what they do because there is a vast majority of people that walk into work on a Monday, they're not fulfilled with what they do. They don't really care so much about the company's success and so I would love to see a place that when anyone is stuck with their career or wanting to do something more interesting, We're the place that they turn to, to find the people that they can learn from and grow alongside. That's so awesome. Well, thank you for coming today to share the story. That's Greg Denton of Matchstick. And if you're listening and you know someone who you'd like to find out more about tech, send them that way. Or if you're working in tech and could share your story, do get in touch. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Simon. Thank you to Greg, to you for having us along in your ears and for everyone who helps make this happen. Do follow Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to rate and leave a review if you like what we do. Enohora. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Kia ora e te iwi, te Ahe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.